Hey guys, my name is Brent. Welcome to this Ruby Volume 3 Episode 2 discussion. Uh, if you missed my last ones, don't forget to check those out. Uh, I did an analysis of the opening credits as well as the Episode 1, which premiered last week, which is I know did not go up last week, but I'm going to be putting it up before this video, so I think it works out in the long run. Uh, okay, so for those of you who don't know how we do things down here, and I would guess that would be most of you considering there's only one up, uh, I am going to go through what I liked, then what I didn't like, then story elements and how it'll tie in throughout the rest of the show so far, at least to my knowledge. So, let's begin. Uh, stuff I liked. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'll admit right up front, guys, there were a lot less things I liked about this episode than there were in the last one, and I'll get to those uh, in a second. But let's start let's start a little bit positive here. Um, okay, even though it was a little bit on the nose, I did like how Uncle Crow is being introduced in a place literally, literally called Crow Bar. I, I don't know, it's just... It's very, it's very on the nose, as if like, oh, hey guys, this guy's Crow, in case you didn't already guess that. Um, hmm. Let's see here. There were a couple moments in the fight scene that were actually pretty great overall. Um, I like the brief shot. Uh, whenever Pier the choreography for Pierre seems to be better than everyone else. Uh, for some reason, I guess it's um, the body contact, which, or it's like, um, she has a versatility as a fighter, which they've already established as she is both acrobatic and her weapons are very versatile with like, you know, the... You know, being a spear and a sword and a gun and the projectile spear basically by using the gun to fire it off and her shield being very versatile as well. Um, so that was pretty good. Her choreography is always fun to watch. Um, let's see. Oh, um, the... Uh, uh, what's it So the part where... Uh, another part I really enjoyed was uh, introducing Nora's semblance, which is tying her more into her original origins, which, for those of you who do not know, Team Juniper, um, all the members of Team Juniper are based on uh, mythological or historical figures who at one point were very well known for uh, cross-dressing. Lyran is based off of Fa Mulan from, uh, the original, from the original legend uh, in China. Uh, Nora Valkyrie is based off of uh, Thor, the god of thunder. Um, uh, John Arc is probably the easiest to recognize as being Joan of Arc, who uh, led a French army against the uh, the English during the Hundred Years' War. And Pierre Nikos, I believe, and uh, I might want to check myself on this one, but Pierre Nikos is, I believe, supposed to be um, uh, Achilles from Achilles from ancient myth, where he was the uh, the untouchable, like the unbeatable warrior, the untouchable warrior who could not be. I believe so. That one I'm not as certain on, so I'll probably do some checking and there'll probably be a text bubble around here telling me how wrong I am, so look forward to that. Um, so other parts that I did like, uh, uh, Sun, okay, so when, um, I love how I love how Nora's semblance is introduced. The semblance introduction for Yang is really, it's one of my most conflicted points in the series from last volume, because it was one of the most awkward pieces of expositional dialogue I've ever heard in Ruby, and that's actually saying a lot considering Ruby. But it was followed by one of the best action beats in the entire series so far, which was Yang punching the mech to death, so I kind of forgave it there. It was really great to see them both, to get it both right here, where they basically, um, uh, semblances, they're kind of falling into a weird situation where, like, the easiest way to explain what their semblance is is literally have somebody who knows them um, explain what it is, which is obviously going to come across as awkward exposition no matter what. But the, I like how they integrated it into a joke here, which was... It was a nice payoff. Whenever Nora gets to, like, deliver a punchline on a joke, it's usually... It usually it usually lands pretty consistently, in my opinion. Um, so that was pretty funny. I liked... Um... um uh, the team, uh, the team name digression, making fun of uh, shipping names as well as um, Arco, uh, just making fun of like team shipping names and uh, that team Juniper was like with Arcos and Stormflower and stuff like that. I thought was pretty funny, and it always and again it has a great payoff with Nora always gl delivering the punchline, which is just the single hammer swipe out. So um, I enjoyed that overall. I'm not mentioning a lot of parts about the fight. You might notice we'll get to the part where I have some uh, issues with it. 
Um, moving on, the next battle up was Team Sun versus uh, versus another team. I forget them off the top of my head, but um, uh, one of the funniest uh, the funniest moment in the series not the, in the series the funniest moment in this episode for me was uh, the girl putting up the the poster with um, with Sun's abs like in a heart. I just thought that was I don't know. I just thought that was hilarious. Um, it was actually nice seeing some um, some guy characters involved. There's a there's always been the discussion of Ruby. Uh, trying to be more female centric with more strong female characters, which I also love for the record Like I am a big proponent and I love strong female characters in my media I just like strong characters in general and the lack of female characters is more what I'm getting at But what I equally don't like are occasionally movies or TV shows that try to go so far in the opposite realm that they don't involve any other guys and Volume 1 kind of suffered from this one in my opinion because the only other guys that were prevalent besides Sun, which was in the final episodes, were John and uh, Ren. And maybe the teachers, I guess you could argue. But Ren and John are obviously not the powerhouses of their teams, so it always seemed a little bit unbalanced. It's nice to see that they're adding up the integration. And not integration like in a cheesy way, but it's just like, oh, obviously, so if you have like these pretty girls who are f going around fighting and kicking all sorts of ass, then it only makes sense to have another team of guys who are doing the exact same thing, and they seem pretty funny. Uh, they seem pretty cool overall, if a little bit dorks. Um, uh, like, um, finally figuring out who voices Scarlet was hilarious. It was, a, was an awesome inside joke. For those of you who weren't aware of it, it's uh, Gavin Free from Achievement Hunter and the Slow Mo Guys who is voicing Scarlet and just hearing him say like, Oh, oh gosh, I hope I don't get sand in, into my... I don't hope I don't get sand into my trousers and my shoes. Oh god, that was just... It was a funny moment for me. It might not hit a lot of people who don't, who aren't aware with other Rooster Teeth content, or for people who already knew that Gavin was voicing Scarlet. But for me, who didn't know that going into it, was a it was a nice it was a nice reveal. Hopefully, he has a little bit more screen time than Joannis did. Um. Okay, that's another thing I didn't like. Uh, yeah, I had some issues with this episode, guys. I'm sorry. I that might give me some hate, but I'm just trying to be I'm trying to be supportive. I overall like the episode. There were just some issues that are like almost confirming some of the fears I had by seeing parts of them in episode one, and I'll get to them in a second. But again, positives. Um, uh, oh, the nut, the nut takedown was actually kind of funny. Um, again, it's funnier if you also know Gavin and his history with his nuts. And those of you who don't know Gavin and the history of his nuts, I must sound like a total perv right now and creep. But there you go. Um, Oh, the ending! I called it! I called it! Maybe. Uh, it's not actually confirmed yet. So for those of you who checked out my uh, opening analysis, my analysis of the opening credits, I pointed out in one section that Weiss and Winter's relationship I think will be a very interesting one this semester, mostly because it's not what we thought it would be. There was a lot of talk uh, when, Winter's when Winter's name was name dropped uh, during volume two that Weiss has issues with her sister as much as her father because she's like she doesn't want to talk to her in the same way she doesn't want to talk to her dad and it was already kind of assumed those were going to be negative emotions like oh the sister is the younger sister is jealous of the older sister and they have conflict issues wow that hasn't been done before so but I predicted by seeing um, the small section that they ran in the opening that Weiss is smiling at Winter and it's not a smile of just like I like her it's an admiration smile smile and I predicted there that uh, winter and that Weiss has Weiss does not have an older sister complication with uh, winter and like a confrontational com um, uh, con yeah I'm saying words that I don't know the meanings of what's wrong with me okay let me back up and make this simple Weiss and winter's relationship is not going to be antagonistic but there is an issue there, but it's a more of an idol complex than anything else. My prediction is that Weiss idolizes her sister beyond reproach. It, uh, and it comes down to just things like her design overall being... It's literally an older, more elegant version of Weiss. And, you can, and then you have to question yourself, why did Weiss choose to dress herself and arm herself in a very similar way to her sister? My opinion, it's because she's trying to emulate her. And the reason why she's always so frustrated with her skills about being perfect is that... She already knows what perfection is, and that's her sister, and she can't quite get to it. And I think that that's going to be an underlying theme throughout Weiss's character journey throughout this story. I could be wrong. That's how it seems to me. And it was confirmed in that last section, partially because we don't know for sure if um, that ship 
that airship at the very end actually does have winter uh, winter Schnee in it. But based on Weiss's reaction, based on her saying she actually came, there's no other real she that Weiss knows in her life except for maybe her mother, but we haven't heard anything of her, heard anything about anyone else in Weiss's family that isn't already there in the tournament. So to me, I think that's winter, and I f***ing called it. <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know. It's always nice to feel a little bit validated in the statements. And then watch me again eat my words next week as I turns out that I'm completely wrong. It's a new character we've never heard of before. Um, fun fact, I believe the woman who, the actress they have who's voicing Winter is the same voice actress for the American dub of Ghost in the Shell for uh, Major Kusagar. Kusagar, whoever the main character is, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with pronunciations and memorizing names apparently um okay so let's go over the parts that i disliked and i'm sorry but yeah there there are kind of a couple of them and it's exasperated by the fact that this scene that this episode had two fight scenes in it both of which i thought were some of the weakest fight scenes ruby has ever produced and saying that i can already hear the fanboys and fangirls jumping down my ass so let me let me explain what I have some issues here. And maybe you guys are feeling it too and you're not admitting it to yourselves. I just want to keep you, I just want you to keep an open mind and listen to what I have to say here. So, just to establish my baseline feelings on Ruby fight scenes. Ruby fight scenes work on um, two primary, um, on two primary motivate, on two primary foundations. They work on the fact that they are, um, that they are paced very well and unrealistically to occasionally into music but also just they have their own like pacing in terms of like how fast and how slow certain uh hits actually land and they are also controlled by um by speed ramping and that was always a big thing with ruby fight scenes in the past that's one of the major strong points of the series the second one is you can always tell what's actually happening and usually what's happening is absolutely insane and crazy so um and so those are the two things that are foundation to their fight scenes the speed of which is happening and the way you can actually see it's happening and both of which I felt were greatly reduced in this episode. This episode probably has the worst use of close-ups the series has ever used so far. Where, um, okay, where do you even begin? Let me just go through some of the notes I was taking as I was watching it. Um, Okay, so one of the reasons why I don't like close-ups for a lot of their scenes, which close-ups are usually used in a fight scenes to convey uh, reactions, to convey reactions to getting hit, or small minor details you need to focus in on, like you know somebody loading a gun or popping off a grenade pin or something like that. But the problem why, but the reason why I don't think it works so well in Ruby is because Ruby is already focusing on it, Ruby is already like its animation style, even though it's gotten better already relies so much on the fact that you're willing to forgive the animation imperfections by staying far away from them that they only become more exasperated the closer you get up to them it is much more entertaining to watch ruby the team ruby for instance talking when they are at a medium to a wide shot away and they have interesting like placements and how they're placed in a room where uh where they're talking to each other that is always much more interesting to me than how they sometimes do which is standard cutting between different characters and you can see the imperfections a lot easier. So, in particular for me in this episode, the uh, the shot where one of the opposing team members who are fighting Juniper uh, uses her sniper rifle to swing up onto the branch. That looked almost incredibly low res to me, and like just it didn't look real. Like, not, and not even just that it didn't look real. It took me out of it. And like, wait, what the hell was that? Like, it took me a second to realize what the shot was even trying to convey. And it was, oh, she's using the sniper rifle to hook herself onto the tree branch. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't look like it would happen, though, even in the established logic of how Ruby works. And uh, and having a close-up on there is one of the main reasons why. If you just flipped her, if she just, like, in a wide or a medium shot flipped herself up there, I'd be like, oh, okay, cool, that's that's what happens in Ruby. That happened early, later in this show. That happened later in this episode, in fact. But to do it with a close-up, it's just, like, it takes me out of the experience. And that's not the only one. Uh, during hits, for instance, like they don't feel as impactful. Uh, the speed felt off in a lot of places. Remember what I said about speed ramping last episode? Where I felt that, wow, the speed ramping was really great here because they knew when to speed it up and they knew when to slow it down for impact. 
a lot of the shots here and a lot of the moves seem slow, especially with Nora's hammer, for instance. Like, they just seemed off in the way that they were trying to hit their opponents, and it didn't feel... It didn't have the same immediacy and the same feel that it's had throughout the series so far. And it would be fine if we started out here. Like, if this was the first action scene I had ever seen of the show, I would think, wow, this is a pretty good action series so far. But we're not talking about a new scene. We're talking about Ruby. We're talking about the show that is known and infamous for its fight scenes. And I know that there are going to be changes involved with Monty not being there anymore. I'm not, this isn't a Monty would have done a better thing or why can't you do what Monty does? Guys, I know it's hard enough for them already not having one of their best friends around. I'm not that cruel or insensitive. But I'm speaking about this as a lover of the show and I think that this is a wrong way of doing things. And it was a wrong way of doing things even when Monty was around. Even in volume 2 they started using more and more close-ups on uh, certain action beats like, you know, hitting, like, you know, firing off the guns for instance. And all of them just seemed out of place like they just didn't seem like they fit the flow of the narrative um one of the other things that i didn't think quite worked was that they're i like one-liners i like it when a show tries to you know add humor on top of the action that's happening right now especially but only <laughs> if the show has structure if the fight has structural beats that allow for it like the Avengers is a really great example for that. The Avengers has tons of one-liners at the end of like all these hits or hit or like you know one-liners that are happening during the hits and those work there. I'm not saying The Avengers is the greatest action movie of all time, but I'm saying that that style of you know witty humor in the middle of a fight works there. It doesn't work so well in Ruby because again it goes against the first principle, pacing. It breaks up the pacing of a fight whenever they cut away from the action to have John say some weird thing to have John like say one weird one-liner kind of thing you know it just doesn't work as hard there are some times where it works Nora is usually the exception whenever Nora usually says something involved with it it works most of the time it doesn't though for me at least and definitely in this episode um yeah it's just god and, and I want to like it so much more than I did like I spent the entire episode wishing that it was getting better but it just it wasn't like there were times where I was looking and I'm like oh this looks like a fight from death battle and that's what it was. Actually, wait, no, that's it right there. This looked like a fight from Death Battle. And that's fine. This isn't Death Battle, though. This is Ruby. This is the show that, in many ways, inspired the way Death Battle does its current fights right now. And if you don't believe me, actually look at them side by side. Um, one of the... for Okay, for instance, for instance. Um, how fights have usually been done in the series so far is that they've been a medium to kind of a wide shot... Uh, side view of the characters as they kind of go out and they exchange blows almost like a fighting game sort of thing where you can see the entire body you can see the entire uh, choreography that happens at the same time uh, for a great perfect example of like you know stereotypical version of this look at the fight between Roman uh, Roman Torchwick and Blake and Sun at the end of volume one that is a perfect example of what I'm talking about and even though the fight animation quality isn't always the best it always looks like the best because it works because you can see what's happening and you can understand what's happening and the pacing is awesome because you can again see what's happening this one they felt the need to do all like these weird things like there was uh there was a point where ren was going hand to hand with another person um with one of the other teammates and it just felt off because instead of just like you know showing back and being like okay cool he's going at it whoa, whoa, whoa now he's over here now he's over here instead we're like we're almost like right up in their face uh, the camera was almost like right up in their face going like, whoa, whoa, and then he hits there, and whoa, he hits there. And I can see what's happening. It's not like it's a bad fight scene. If this, if this were a live action American style action movie, that would be great. That would be fine. Because that's what has been done, it's what it's, ex and what it's expected. That's, it's fine. It's great. It's a great fight scene. But this isn't that. This is Ruby. This is Ruby. This is a show that never had to rely on swooping camera shots to make the impacts look harder because it managed to do that just by the pacing of the hits alone. And look, I don't know how to fix it. I'm, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a fighting choreographer expert here and, I'm, and I could do it better than them. I can't. I can't do it better than them. They're doing the best they can. I respect that. And again, this isn't a Monty thing. This isn't that. This is just me as a fan of the show realizing that, hey, there was a significant drop in the action quality here. You had two fight scenes in the same episode, which to me is usually like, oh, crap, that's awesome. Especially in the context and the structure of the episode. It was meant to show off the two other teams, that, the other two teams that are going to be a big part of this show. Team Juniper, Team Sun. And it's supposed to be two awesome action sequences to show like what they're going to bring to the table going forward. And what I got was, well, that was okay, I guess. It was a little disappointing, though. And, yeah, I'm sounding a lot more negative here than I 
I really intended. Look, I overall still like the episode. It's just, you know, it's frustrating when you see something that you love starting to go off in a bad direction that you know will just lead to a that will just lead to a drop in quality. Um, l let's look at Team Sun's fight, for example, which this one was even worse than Juniper's, uh, in my opinion. Like, Juniper didn't always hang together, but at least it worked overall. Like I said, there were great moments between. Uh, between Pyrrha, for instance. Like, Pyrrha's fights and Nora's moments were pretty great. Ren actually had a pretty cool moment when he's charging across the field, um, uh, trying to avoid sniper fire. That was a cool, that was a really cool shot, again, because you could see what was happening. Um, uh, but t when Team Sun sets up to the table, steps up to the plate, it's just, oh my gosh, what, what happened? Why are, uh, okay, here's one. Why are the knockouts stupidly easy? Not even, like, the... The knockouts weren't even finishing moves for Sun's fight. It was just like, oh, she got hit a couple times, and now she got hit again, and it's like, uh, no, she's out for the count. Okay, what? And then Sage. Sage, who's, this is his first time he's getting introduced to the series, is like, tornadoed out of there because there are three tornadoes coming in on him, and he's just standing there going like, huh, what's this? What's this? No, what's this? What's it? Whoa, whoa, whoa! And then he gets thrown out. It's like, look, I... It seemed very contrived. It seemed like they were just trying to hit their beats within the action sequence so that they could show off like who does what better and stuff and show off their weapons. <laughs> I'm sorry though, you can't have a fight scene specifically to stage what everyone's gonna do if you're gonna pay it off with some weak thing, which is just a weak moment that doesn't portray the characters well and doesn't portray the action well and doesn't portray the world well. Like, Sun gets through this round and it's like, Man, that's the best humanity has to offer? No wonder they're gonna get invaded by Grimm later in the series. I mean, why wouldn't they? That's just, they came off incredibly weak when they should have been stronger. And we've seen them do stronger things. Like, Sun was a badass in season one. We brought up those nunchucks and he was fighting Torchwick. That was one of the most jaw-dropping, awesome moments of the first season was that, oh, it's like, oh yeah, I have this giant staff that, like, shoots out things and I can use it, like, it all, like, kung fu style. Oh, but guess what? It's also nunchucks, and now the nunchucks have shotguns on it. That was the greatest part of Volume 1 for me. Okay, it wasn't the greatest. It was one of the greatest for me. And this fight lacks it, and all of these fights are lacking that awesome moment. They're lacking, like, a pinnacle, like, oh, that was an amazing moment. Um, Juniper has a couple that are close with with especially with Nora but Nora's already kind of been playing out so we know what we're expecting here we know going into that fight that yeah either Pyrrha or Nora is going to deliver the finishing blow for this one and it turned out to be Nora okay because we've already seen that this was a chance to see something new we could see a new team and we could see what they have to offer to the table especially Sage and Scarlet who we haven't seen yet in the series and we have no idea what they're going to bring to the equation I saw the fight and I still don't know what they're going to bring to the equation because basically I saw Sage get one shot it out of the ring like 30 seconds in and Scarlet got hit in the balls by his teammate or by his teammate's coconut. So, okay, I guess. And then they kind of win because the girls all stupidly stand in the water when Neptune shows up and shocks the water with his electricity. I mean, I don't know. It's just, uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe there are probably a lot of you who have already kind of left off by now and you're already labeling this video a rant. And look, it kind of is, but it's not a rant out of hate. I love Ruby. I love the show. I love what they're doing with the show for the most part. I like what the story's going. I like the setup for the series. Um, the fighting last volume, the fighting in the last moment or in the last episode was fantastic. I love that. I just want more of that. And this episode didn't do didn't deliver at all. It delivered mediocre action sequences from that are on par with other web series and other movies, but not on the par with Ruby's action scenes so far. It tried to replace them with comedic moments that only served to break up the flow even more, even though some of those moments were admittedly pretty funny. Neptune being afraid of water could have been was actually a really funny gimmick at first and could have translated to a funny fight scene. It just didn't. It turned into a slapstick situation that didn't make any sense with the logic of the series so far. And I know Ruby's always played loose with the facts of logic and stuff. Like, it's, it's... All I can do is hope that they get better. And maybe I'll learn to accept this better. Maybe I have my expectations set too high by that awesome first episode, but th that's just how I feel in it. Um, 
Oh, another thing that this is kind of... It was a missed opportunity, and one that I don't believe Ruby has done since maybe the early parts of Volume 1 is they don't have a great... No, 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 no. They did it at the end of Volume 2, so maybe they're waiting for it for later. But Ruby, especially with its weapons, lives and dies on the oh my god, are you kidding me moments. Like, they live and die on that kind of like, what? It's a scythe. It's a... No, it's like... Wait, what's that girl having behind her back? Oh, it's a giant gun. Oh my god, it's a giant scythe. Like, it lives and breathes. It's like, oh, what is that grenade launcher? Oh, it's also a giant hammer. Because why not, right? Ruby lives and die. It doesn't live and die. Ruby excels during the moments where it can just do things for the sake of doing them. That is just unquestionably great and awesome. That's why I love Ruby. Because it has moments like that. And it's not afraid to do balls to the wall things. like... Think a bow staff isn't enough? Okay, cool. It's also nunchucks and also shotgun rifles. because And also shotgun nunchucks things. Because why not, right? And that works. And that works well in it. There were a lot of missed opportunities in this episode, basically. Basically, none of the new weapons I've seen in this series... In this series. Basically, none of the new, epi none of the new weapons I've seen in this volume... Are good. Like, they look... They just look a, they look like a combination between just uninspired and just, you know, just lackluster compared to whatever we've seen. With the exception of the skateboard, um, of the skateboard, like, mini machine gun pistols. That was actually kind of a cool thing, and that's probably been the only cool, um, cool moment. But, again, it wasn't even as strong within it because we already saw it during the trailer. So, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to fix this, but, yeah. There were some funny moments. There were some great action moments in there, too. There were some great gags. Overall, though, it just seemed like a gigantic drop of quality compared to Volume 1. Or, not to compared to Volume 1, compared to Episode 1. So, I don't know. Here's hoping they get better. Uh, I wish they had... <laughs> I never thought I would say this as a Ruby fan, but I wish they had less fighting in this, scene, in this one and more dialogue and more talking. Because... Uh, yeah. Okay, but um, on the story points, there were actually a lot, and this is kind of what also makes it better. There were also there were actually a lot of interesting story points in here that I wanted to uh, take a closer look at and understand. Um, so I understand the structure of this episode. What this episode is meant to do is that it's it's supposed to explain to any new audience who comes into this with fresh eyes, or any returning audience that okay, so we already saw we dedicated the whole last episode to Team Ruby. That's their show. They are the main characters of this series. But also, two other teams are going to be taking a large part in this one, which is Team Juniper and Team Sun, which we've seen from the opening. So this was a introductory. This was supposed to be an introductory look into them and to look into what they're trying to do, um, which is cool. It it works on a structural level to get to know them through a fight and maybe through like some dialogue exchanges and stuff. If only the fight was better. Um, Crow is a Crow is a drunk. Uncle, her uncle, Crow, their uncle Crow is a drunk. That was. I wasn't expecting it. I don't know how that'll really lead into it, but he seems very grizzled, very like, oh yes, I don't got time for this shit. I'm too old for this shit. So I don't know. Could be cool. Um, it was a nice little bit of uh, detail, and he obviously has a confrontation with uh, Winter coming up, as hinted in the opening, and apparently in this one where he says like, no, that's the fight I'm coming for, which was Winter's ship flying in. Um, uh, all three teams moved on to the two by two rounds, which I can only guess is going to be Sage, uh, which is which I can only guess is going to be Sun and Neptune, and um, Pyrrha and Nora, and then we already know that it's going to be Weiss and Yang. That's my estimations for the other teams, but it makes the most sense. Um, again, it just makes the most sense for their teams to be split up that way. Like they work the best like that. But then again, if I had to pick for Ruby, for Team Ruby, I would have picked Yang and Ruby. So, mate, what do I know, right? Um, Nora's semblance is uh, reviewed, which or is revealed, not revealed, not reviewed. And, hey, it's pretty cool. Lightning, electricity, again, calling back to, to the god of thunder, Thor, which he's based on. Okay, that's cool. And uh, that's actually an interesting point there, where uh, combined with the fact that we know that Pure is... Um, semblance is polarity, and specifically she uses it to prevent anyone from hitting her, making her look like untouchable, which again ties her back to the uh, ancient Greek hero Achilles, which she's based on. 
I'm pretty sure she's based on it might have been a different hero that I'm thinking of. I just can't remember the name. I'm a terrible name person. I'm sorry. But that might give us hints into what Jean and uh, Ren's semblance is going to be based on the legends of uh, based on the legends of Fabulon and uh, the stories of Joan of Arc. Now, I did some research in preparation for this to try and make a guess. Honestly, I got nothing. Uh, I got nothing. Uh, the difference between them is that Pyrrha and is that the Greek hero and Thor had specifically non supernatural specifically had more supernatural esque kind of powers, whereas Joan of Arc and Fambulan were almost known specifically for being a little bit more typical and not having supernatural powers except for maybe leadership. So I don't really have a guess so far. Anyone else is willing to guess? And if you do, put it in the comment section down below. I would love to hear your guesses on this matter. Um, okay, let's see. I think I had one more point. Uh, oh, uh, Winter coming to... Um, obviously, like, Winter showing up at the end of there. Why is she there? We don't know. We know... What we do know about Winter so far is that clearly she's had training in combat, probably at Huntsman Academy, and she's probably a huntress herself. Um, and the fact that she is affiliated and probably works high up within the Shini Dust Corporation, uh, which is interesting why she wouldn't actually be in line for, um, for heiress of the, con of the company, curiously enough. But, um, why is she there? So, is she there as a representation for the Shini Dust Company? Is she there just as a, you know, aficionado of fights or whatever? Or, or is she there to support her sister? Uh, we don't quite know yet, but given the fact that the military has a very large presence in this one, and that um, control has been control of defense of the Vital Festival has been given over to Ironwood and his military crew, and that the di and from what we've seen from Volume Two, that the Shinee Dust Corporation has a lot of affiliation and ties to the Atlas military infrastructure, that can mean that there might be a time they might be meeting up to discuss something, or or here's another thing. Um, Based on what we can guess from the trailer and from, you know, how we've set up things so far, Crow is probably going to have a meeting with, uh, with Ozpin, Ironwood, and Glinda, uh, Glinda at some point to discuss whatever threat is going on and whatever Cinder's doing because clearly he has intelligence on them. Maybe Winter is part of that same group of, like, you know, older people who are kind of pulling the strings behind the scenes. I mean, it would make sense that one of the world's leader, leading supply of dust would be part of, you know, the defense, along with, like, you know, the lead military guy and, like, the lead mastermind guy, which is Ospin, and the rogue drunk, which is, um, which is Crow. All speculation. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Put them in the, uh, thing down below. Put it all, put it all there. That sounded dirty. I did not mean that to. I've got to get better at that. <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you guys so much for watching, and uh, as always, see you guys next week for episode 3. See ya. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I had a lot of, uh, shall we call it, fun recording that. I honestly didn't expect that to turn into a rant. I just, uh, I guess I want to say a little bit extra piece here at the end before I tell you, you know, the standard stuff like like and subscribe and all that. Um, but look, for me, it's not that I don't like where the show is going. I like where it's going story, story and structure wise. I accept, well, sorry. I accept the fact that things will have to change because there are new creators at the helm with, uh, Carrie in the director's role instead of Monty. I get it. I'm fine. I'm basically okay. And I've said my piece about it and I'm going to respect the, to, I'm going to respect the direction that Ruby goes in from now on because I understand that it's a new creative head at the helm of it. That's fine. My issue was specifically with the fight scenes here, and I'm just hoping that on the off chance that maybe they see this, they can hear what the fans think of it. I'm not so naive to think that they can just change the entire volume to think of it. Uh, I, they can just change the entire volume for it, but if any of them are thinking about why maybe some of the fight scenes are lacking in quality compared to older ones, I'm offering my suggestions into maybe why. Why? For, for as little as a college student's version, as a film college student's, like, you know, opinion is on the subject. This is what I believe is wrong with why these fight scenes aren't working as well. Take that how you will. So, anyways, love your guy. It, on the off chance that you guys are watching me, I love Ruby so much. I've watched it since the beginning. Love you guys. Love all your work. Cool. 
So, um, anyways, on to my standard speech that I say here. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe. Um, don't forget to follow us on all of our linkies, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, our weekly Vine. Uh, don't forget to follow us there if you are interested in, like, you know, six-second little jokes like that. Um, if you want to see more of our content, this is the last episode right here for episode one if you missed it. And this is, um, what was I going to put here? Oh, this is a music video I made a couple years back called, uh, shit, what was it called? Nevermore. It's basically like, you know, I don't know, it was for the band that I was in, uh, called Days of Tomorrow. It's called Nevermore. I still like it a lot, personally, but I'm a little bit biased there, so what can I say? As you can see, it's got lots of fire and ravens and flying around and people engulfed in flames. I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. Maybe you thought you could like it. Let me know what you think there. So, um, yeah. See you guys next time. Signing off.